Last year, Butler shocked the March Madness world by coming one shot away from defeating Duke in the finals. At that time, they were a five seed. This year, odds were against them even more when they were given an eight seed, but still, it's been much of the same from the Bulldogs. Day two of the Colorado State Wrestling Tournament here at the Pepsi Center. We started off with right around 60 to 65 local wrestlers. Obviously, that number is down, but guess what? Jesse Hofschneider, that's one guy we've been watching, having a great day at the quarterfinals. If the Rockies had it their way, they would choose not to play the Pirates. Colorado is just two and four against the team that finds themselves in the basement of the NL Central. Maybe the solution to those pesky scallywags is more cargo. And more Super Bowl party action coming from the Steel's house. Good party over here. Oh, thank you, girls. Look at this tray of food. That is some real Wisconsin eating right there. Who says you can't have fun on Super Bowl Sunday while also working? We'll be right back. All right, so this right here is not hard work, but getting a body ready for a bikini competition like Sherry Zenizek and Michelle Hughes are doing, now that is hard work. 14 teams piled into Bronson Arena this weekend for the 4A Western Regional Wrestling Tournament. After day one, three local teams competing in the tourney, Palisade, Montrose, and Delta, all ranked in the top five. Wouldn't it be something they all finished in the top three? And you guys can talk football. What's Who's going on? Picking? I want to go with the Bears, but that would, that would just agree with you, and I yeah. don't want to. No, the Bears. So I'm going to be stubborn. So the Warrior Classic will wrap up tomorrow, and we will have highlights and final scores right here. But for now, let's head over to the hardwood. Lots of high school action on the road, but we'll start right here in Palisade. Stanley's success got me thinking. How much do the two of us have in common besides our names? Well, apparently, a few things. We were both born in 1987. Turns out we were both at the 2009 U.S. Open. He came in 53rd at the tournament. I was actually working as a little runner for a media company over there at Torrey Pines in San Diego. We both have never won a major title, obviously, for me. And while the golfer won over $100,000 this year, well, I wish I could have earned that much. You guys think about that. Come on, you know, you know, you know those are some good comparisons. Come on, that's that's got that's good for something. Small world, what do you say? We'll be right back. <laughs> Ivan, coach says if you don't sing try to serenade me right now, you're not in the lineup. Let's let's hear something, man. <laughs> I feel like gravity was just pushing against me the entire time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you for the cheering, guys, you know. Really motivational. Karen's ball is still fighting gravity. David Tom's on the final hole for birdie and to share the lead with Arjun Atwal. Got it. And back to McCarran's ball. Patience is a virtue, my friends. Drops in and no lie, that was really in real time. Took 18 seconds for that ball to drop in the hole. That's going to do it for sports. Couple Mesa State games on the schedule for tomorrow. We'll have highlights of those as well as the Broncos and Ravens game. We'll be back. One of six no hitters in 2010 and it's one of our top plays. April 17, 2010, it has a ring to the Rockies fans for one big reason. It was the night that Ubaldo Jimenez used his arm to speak up. The night Colorado's soft-spoken ace tossed the franchise's first no-hitter in Atlanta. And it is also number eight of our most exciting sports stories of the year. One and two now. Ground ball towards second. It's a Rocky Mountain high and a no-hitter. He's just a silent giant. That's what he is. The silent giant went into that game on April 17th with just 33 major league wins and two complete games in his young career, but all the talent in the world. He was throwing his heart in the ninth inning into about his 115th to 120th pitch as he was in the first inning. <laughs> it was moving. It was his night to shine. The fastball hitting 100 miles an hour. The slider straight filthy. And when you see Ubaldo Jimenez swinging the bat like this, you know it's going to be a special night. But like any no-hitter, the pitcher needed his defense. Fly ball, left center field, pretty well hit. Fowler on the run, saves the no-hit bid. It pays to be good, but even the good ones need to get lucky sometimes. I didn't start the game good. I was wise, like throwing the ball everywhere. For the same guy, I was able to come back and just get the guys out, you know. The first no-hitter of the year set off a chain reaction. If you include the playoffs, baseball saw six no-nos. Dallas Braden of the Athletics, Edwin Jackson of the Diamondbacks, Matt Garza of the Tampa Bay Rays, and Roy Halladay did it twice for the Phillies. And then, of course, there was the seventh no-hitter that came in Detroit. Cabrera will cut it off. Galarraga covers. He's out. Oh, he's safe. 
Oh, uh, wait, uh, about that seventh no-hitter. That's really a whole nother story in itself. So anyway, by tossing the first no-hitter of the new decade, Ubaldo Jimenez not only cooled off Hot Lanta, made it straight to number eight of our 11 most exciting plays of 2010. Kyle Stanley joining us now live in the studio for a very special report. Kyle, how is it that firefighting can also be considered a sport? <laughs> well, Natalie, think of the main components of a sports team. Each successful squad has defined positions, well-trained and physically fit players, and they're all after one ultimate goal. And for one station here in Grand Junction, they find many similarities in being a firefighter and an athlete. Growing up having a sports background and seeing things that I've seen and being involved in pretty much every team sport there has been is once I got on the job here is you really realize that it's no different at all. Whether it's putting out a fire, saving a life, or rushing someone to the hospital, the black crew at Station 3 in Grand Junction, Colorado works as a team to get their job done. You could say they work just like a sports team. It correlates to a team in a big way. Um, if you don't train, if you don't practice, you don't do well in the game. So first, let's take a look at the physical side. We're actually required to be in top physical shape for our jobs. A firefighter with all his equipment, a tool, a pack, can weigh anywhere from 60 to 100 pounds or more. And in order to get themselves into great physical condition, they implement functional training. And by functional, I mean something that actually transfers over to being a firefighter. When you're using a sledgehammer on the tire, you're simulating chopping with an axe. As far as when you see us using the, uh, the barbell, and what that is, we have a tool that's actually a pike pole that we actually have to pull ceiling from overhead to get to hidden or trap fires. We're a football team, we gotta work together. Everybody has to know their position. And just like a football team, you could compare all of these firefighters to certain players on the football field. The running back that makes the action happen, the wide receiver in charge of hauling in the equipment, and of course the quarterback that gives his players direction. Kind of coordinate things, the scene a little bit. Okay, go ahead and get a blood pressure. Let's go ahead and put the monitor on him. Okay, sir, we're going to put a couple stickers on you. Let's go ahead and get some, uh, some meds on board. Call and report to the hospital, and then uh, we're good to go. And a team cannot run without a head coach. In Black Crew's case, that is Captain Zag. Having a good coach is critical. I mean, look at the Broncos. <laughs> well, as a, uh, a coach of a team, of course, you have to have everything in play. Um, we all have jobs and duties, and uh, we have to practice prior to so we can make it very streamlined when we get there. So we see what these guys do to get ready for a call. Now that they're on a fake call, this is a drill. It's kind of like a team practice. They're going to do their thing, and then they're going to talk about how they can improve the next time. We have a, a fire on the second floor apartment, room 402. Go ahead and pull a condo lay. The team treats it like a real game situation, communicating with each other, working with haste to get ultimately the fire put out. And then when they're done, they have a team meeting. We should talk about this. Okay. So what my goal is, is for length of hose, is we always need a two and a half. Will they be able to hook onto our line down the middle? Drop something over that railing and just pull it. That would have been great, yes. You know, you, you make a play and it's it goes great. And then, you know, further down the field, you try it again and it doesn't work. You know, you've learned a lesson from it to maybe tweak it a little bit better to come out on top next time. That way, if the next time is the real deal, they can get it right. Dispatching with two out of Colorado West. Uh, we're going on an emergency medical call uh, with a, a patient with a possible stroke. What's pretty unique about this is exactly why we practice like we play, because now we're going to implement exactly what we just did on the calls we showed you, but do in real life, so it allows us to function on scene. Luckily, this particular call was not too serious, but the guys were prepared for anything. All right, sir. We're going to just keep the oxygen on you get ready to go to the hospital. Well, after a long, hard day's work, these guys get to sit over a hot meal and bond just like a team, and I took the liberty of doing it with them. Don't mind if I do. This food looks absolutely amazing. Mm. Oh, what a great job it is to be a firefighter. Love it. And, of course, the only reason I think being a firefighter is so great is because they gave me a free meal. In all seriousness, those guys truly impressed me with the way they function as a well-oiled machine. Kind of a championship firefighting squad, if you will. Just switch off those firefighting helmets to football helmets and you've got me fooled. Natalie, back to you.
Looking at all four regions in the NCAA bracket, it was believed that Kansas would have the easiest road to the Final Four. Including today's game against VCU, the toughest seed that the Jayhawks have had to face was ninth seeded Illinois. It was 11th seeded Rams today. Should be cake for the top seed, right? Not so much. First half, Rams lead by eight. Jamie Skeen adds three more. VCU all over Kansas early on. But the number one team isn't going down without a fight. Tyshawn Taylor goes up strong. He's fouled, and the bucket counts because of a goal 10. Suddenly, it's a two-point game, but VCU separates. Joey Rodriguez finds Bradford Burgess under the hoop. Sweet alley-oop. And the Rams do the unthinkable. They knock off Kansas with a 71-61 victory. How about Kentucky and North Carolina? Two and a four seed going at it. Four minutes left in the game. North Carolina trailing by four. Harrison Barnes finds a way to make that fall. And he's fouled. 67-65 game. Two minutes left. Tie game, but Brandon Knight knocks down the three. How good has this guy been during the tournament? Game high, 22 points. And Kentucky defeats UNC 76-69 to move on to the final four. So here is how that unusual Final Four will shape up. Kentucky and Connecticut will match up in a battle of three and four seeds. And two teams you never expected to see in the Final Four, VCU and Butler, will battle out for a spot in the finals. That's an 11 and 8 seed. Not a single one or two seed to be seen. Very unusual. 970 Muscle, they're hitting the big show. Headed up by Derek Trombetta, 12 locals will compete in the NPC Bikini Figure Bodybuilding and Physique Competition in Boulder, Colorado next week. Trombetta and his team have been training for roughly 16 weeks to prepare for the event on April 2nd at the Boulder Theater. The founder of 970 Muscle not only trained this group, but he will also compete as well. A little double dip for him. And most of his trainees give him all the credit for any success that they might have in this upcoming competition. Derek is full of energy. Every single day you come in here, he's excited. He's, ex he's excited to see that you're excited. And um, the motivation that he brings, because he himself is doing the competition with us, so he can actually relate to you. I, mean, I think the chances are very good. It's a subjective sport, so as long as you put your all into it, you do everything you need to to get ready for it, you're a winner no matter what. But I'm looking really for, there's a few people there that are gonna pretty much, I think, gonna be cleaning up. It's gonna be pretty exciting. I'm really happy for them. So once again, April 2nd, that's going to be next week, a Saturday. Mason State baseball team was able to make great strides in their road play yesterday with a couple wins over Regis. Today, they went for a series win against the Rangers, but thanks to a walk-off single, the Mavericks were denied of that win. They lost 6-5 to five to Regis. Mesa tied the game in the eighth after trailing for most of it, but they couldn't quite complete the comeback. The Mavericks return home next weekend for a four-game set with New Mexico Highlands. And it was another tough day on the road for the softball team. Mesa was 10 run ruled in the first game. Sarah Jordan only lasted one plus inning. She did not record an out in the second inning as the Grizzlies put up 10 runs in the second. And they could not avoid the series sweep in game two. Adam State edge MSC 16 to 15, a real slugfest in nine innings. Mesa led by two runs with two outs in the eighth, but Jordan couldn't close out the game. They will return home to take on Fort Lewis next weekend. Rockies are just a few days away from opening day. Ubaldo Jimenez took the mound today against the Oakland Athletics as part of a split squad day. Colorado looking for their 19th win of the spring. Ubaldo just dealing early on, gets Ryan Sweeney looking to start the game. Fastball nips the corner. Fourth inning, A's threatening with runners on the corners, but the threat is a race. 1-6-3 double play. We remain scoreless. Ubaldo picks six scoreless innings, striking out three, and I think, just think, he might be ready for the season. Colorado pulls out a few runs late to win it 5-2. Quick look at NASCAR Auto Club 400. Two laps to go. Kevin Harvick trails Jimmy Johnson for the lead, so he decides to give him a little love tap. Guess what? It worked. Harvick takes the lead on the final lap to win this one in Fontana. And finally tonight, time for this week's 11 Sports Double Take. We take you back to March Madness and what madness it has been leading up to the Final Four. You can't help but notice all the upsets, and I can't help but curse at the TV every time there's an upset. I had Kansas and Ohio State in my finals for the bracket. Gosh dang it, so much for a winning that million bucks. Scott, you still not even close. Okay, that's it for sports. We'll be right back.